Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, retail sales in the state are at their highest levels in years. We'll find out why. We'll also learn about the Mayo Clinic's new stem cell laboratory set to open next year. And we'll hear about a local organization that works to empower women to transform their lives. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Arizona monthly retail sales are at their highest level since just before the recession back in 2007. Here to help crunch the numbers is ASU economist Dennis Hoffman. Always a pleasure here. What's going on with these retail sales? Ted, great to be here and great to be talking about Good news, and it's very good news on the, the retail front. The Arizona consumer evidently isn't distracted by, you know, 110 degree temperatures or whether or not we're going to bomb Syria. Uh, they're just going shopping. What's driving the increase here? Well, it, you know, part of it is just uh, when, we, when we talk about high single di digit, and it's month after month after month, high single digit growth year over year. Um, part of that is fueled by the fact that, you know, in 2009 and 2010, folks just stopped buying consumer durables. So the, the pace of automobile sales, I mean, if you can envision this, all of the automobiles sold in the state of Arizona in, say, 2004, and by the way, 2007, same number, about $8.4 billion yeah. sold. At the bottom, that went down to $4.4 billion. So we lost almost half of it. And now we're back to 6.4. And it's growing at a clip of 15% year on year. And so we grow two more years, we're going to be back to that $8.5 billion. Number. Does, this, does that mean folks are buying the more expensive, the durable stuff? Are they going to the $0.99 cent store, a little bit in between? Right. What's happening out there? Well, what we saw in the downturn is that, that and this is very classic when, when confidence erodes, People just pulled in their horns. I'm not going to buy a car. I'm not going to invest in the house. I'm, you know, I'm just going to hold off. And because of that dearth in sales during the downturn, there's a pent up demand for those durables now. Uh, and you know, with interest rates the way they are, you know, think about an automobile. If you can, if you can swing the lease, you can lease an incredibly fuel efficient automobile, maybe twice the fuel efficiency of your existing car for like 200 bucks a month, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a, a, an amazing deal if you can swing a lease. What about things like construction? What about yes. government contracts? What are we seeing there? Well, construction's coming back, uh, you know, nowhere near like it was, uh, uh, again, before this uh, downturn. In fact, you know, there's, there's kind of an interesting story. If you, if you look at Retail today versus retail three years ago, it's a really great story. If you look at retail today versus 10, 20, or 30 years ago, it's a much different story. So folks are, are spending a smaller share of their incomes on taxable retail items. And, and construction is a big piece of that. We're just not spending as much on construction as we have historically. Explain this to me. We've got retail sales the best in years here. I mean, uh, since right. before the Great Recession, and yet the unemployment rate sits there stagnant at or near 8%. Yeah, well, we've lost 180,000 workers. Well, is that unusual to have those two? It, it's really fascinating to me. So. And, and couple this with this statistic that everybody talks about, that the employment uh, per population ratio is declining. It is at almost an historical or recent historical low. So there's fewer people working out of the total population. But Ted, if you slice that by age, the older folks, 55 to 64, that older uh uh, part of the population, and 64 actually into the 70s. The employment to population ratio in that cohort is actually going up, and it's going up pretty dramatically. So it's, it's really ironic to me. So you've got older people, baby boomer generations, staying in their jobs longer than what they have historically, and, and that's really holding the, the younger folks back in terms of job opportunity. Now, the data suggests that with fewer workers, we've got aggregate incomes 
about the same as the peak. We're going to have individual income tax receipts this year at or above the peak level. Part of that's capital gains, by the way. But uh, so there is some spending. There's some income being earned out there. And that's manifesting itself in these retail sales. So with, with unemployment rates stagnant and yet retail sales up so strong, it's not as if a, a small group of folks are out there buying everything in sight. Well, it's hard to know who's doing all of the buying. I think that the well-to-do are certainly doing their share. They're and doing more. well, aren't they? Yes. So uh, that is absolutely true. But the interesting thing to me is how spending and aggregate incomes can be at or near the peak uh, levels, at least in some of the categories. We still got a ways to go in auto sales, but in many of the others, it's, it's come back very nice. But we're still short 180,000 workers. Now, that suggests that many of those workers back at the peak were lower wage, service providing, uh, mobile, migrant construction workers at lower incomes. Last question. Uh, we've heard this criticism for years that Arizona is too dependent on, on sales tax revenues. Right. You buying that? Well, it seems to be, and I've followed this, this is year 35 now, geezer time for me. But, uh, you know, it seems to be the only tax, if there is a palatable tax in Arizona, one that the voters will at least tolerate, it does seem to be the sales tax. And you see that in, in the way they have voted on various initiatives, be they transportation to the one cent temporary tax. Uh, they seem to have tolerated it. Um, if you had a broader base, and, and we've eroded our sales tax base away, we've got to get online in the mix, we've got to have a broader base, bring in some personal services, and then I think the sales tax could be a real sustaining source of revenue for the All state. All right. Good stuff. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Ted. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. Mayo Clinic in Arizona will open its own stem cell laboratory next spring. The lab will initially be dedicated to storing and processing stem cells used for bone marrow transplants at Mayo Clinic Hospital and Phoenix Children's Hospital. Here to tell us more is Dr. Ruben Mesa, head of the Cancer Center at Mayo, and Dr. Henry Tazalar, who will run the lab. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ted. Great to be here, Ted. Uh, a new stem cell lab. Explain, please. Well, stem cells are the earliest cells in our body, and they have a variety of uses as we try to help patients heal from their diseases. So the initial use is for individuals who require a bone marrow transplant. Those are areas in which individuals have a blood disease or a bone marrow disease such as a leukemia, and we take cells from either them or from a, a donor. We process those cells and then give them to the patient to help them to overcome their disease. I want to get back to bone marrow transplants in a second here, but as far as the lab is concerned, um, processing and storing stem cells, what's involved here? The laboratory will receive patients' cells, and they, so a patient will have, uh, right now we can do a stem cell collection, so the patient is in a unit, they, uh, they're hooked up to a machine that takes off their blood, we take out the stem cells, those are then frozen, and when the patient is has ready to get their stem cells back as a bone marrow transplant, if you will, then they're then they're thawed and reinfused. So the the process of 
Stem cell storage is, you know, labeling, making sure that the, they're properly stored so that they're viable, they're ready, you know, they're alive when we put them back in, into the patients. Is this something that's new as far as research and treatment, or is this just a bigger storage facility? This is our, this will be our own storage facility. So, we okay. currently have an outside vendor that we use. We're bringing this in-house because that will allow us to do a number of things related to research down the road that, we, that would be harder to do without having our own lab. What goes into storing and processing stem cells? Is, does it have to be a certain procedure involved? Does there have to be certain storage conditions involved? What happens here? Well, well the lab is really very much at, at the vanguard of, of a new change in medicine. So there's what the lab will do day one, which is to take someone's cells, and it is a very complex process to, to store them in such a safe way so that they can be given back to the patient at the appropriate time. But the future state is very exciting, and it's really at the vanguard of a new area we call regenerative medicine, where we take these earliest cells, and we take them from a patient, an individual, and we use them to, uh, to process them and give them back to the patient in a way that they help to regenerate organs that have been injured from heart disease or liver disease or cancer. Uh, and help to really restore organ function. Is this the kind of thing where someone younger in life can have stem cells stored for years and come back later in life, or is there is there a you know a, some sort of shelf life as far as these stem cells are concerned? It's a very good question because it really is both. One, as many people are storing the the cord blood from their children these days, whether they develop the need for a bone marrow transplant in the future. It is possible in the future that these cells, some of which will be stored in facilities such as ours, may be modified or grown in the future to help either the children or as they become adults be able to receive benefit from those cells. And as, uh, back to the lab again here now, why is this new lab necessary? Is it, is it important to have your own lab as opposed to, was, how was it done before? How was it done now? We're, currently we, we use an outside vendor, so the cells leave our facility, they go to an outside vendor, and they're about oh, 25 miles away and so there's a time delay there's you know working with an outside vendor they've been great to work with but the working with our colleagues in Rochester and across the Mayo Enterprise with research protocols that we feel it would be better to be able to process our own stuff in-house the, the cells in-house and we'll, down the road we'll be able to manipulate them so the laboratory is about a six thousand square foot lab four thousand will be devoted to storage and processing and another two thousand will be devoted to research and it's really the access to that research down the road that we're really excited and it's one of the main reasons we're very excited about bringing this in-house so they'll be right next door to each other those two laboratories in a way that it would be very difficult for us to do if we had an outside processing facility. Talk about the state of stem cell research right now. It seems like in the past we've had some bumps along the road here and some controversies here and controversies there. Where do we stand right now? There are a number of clinical trials that we are involved with at, at Mayo Clinic. Cardiac disease, uh, liver disease, other types of uh, neurologic degenerative diseases. We have ongoing treatment trials. I would say there's been some limited success with mm -hmm. those. I think a lot more work needs to be done, and this is part of that work. Talk about bone marrow transplants, which you referred to earlier, is obviously the major factor here. Um, again, I can remember years ago when folks, bone marrow transplants, very alternative, very out there, not, not a lot of success. Talk about how successful those transplants are and who benefits from those. Well, it's a very important therapy that really can offer a cure to people who suffer from blood cancers that otherwise wouldn't have a chance to be cured. Diseases that we sometimes just cannot cure with chemotherapy alone. So areas that are important, whether they be children who have leukemia, who receive a bone marrow transplant at Phoenix Children's, which is part of our, part of our bone marrow transplant program, whether they be patients at, at our hospital, at Mayo Clinic, who are overcoming uh, acute leukemia or other bone marrow conditions, it offers an opportunity they wouldn't have otherwise. It, it's a very uh, uh, complex, difficult road, uh, but we're very pleased with, uh, with both the, the, the success and the, the dedication of our team, a as well as the, the outcomes that these patients are having. I ask because uh, I'm old enough to remember when bone marrow transplants were considered somewhat experimental. Are they still considered such? 
So I'd say as therapy, they're not considered experimental. That being said, there are many experimental aspects to continue to try to push the envelope so that bone marrow transplants can be safer, so that bone marrow transplants can be more effective. So a center that is a leading center such as ours, the largest in the Southwest at Mayo Clinic in Arizona, the focus is on how do we make bone marrow transplant safer and more effective for patients today and for patients tomorrow. And the future of that particular goal looks like this will obviously help the storage facility. Absolutely, yeah. As far as research is concerned, where do you, where do you see stem cell research going next? What is the next major hurdle or the next major challenge? Well, I think there are, you know, there's a lot of organs in the body and a lot of different tissues, and I think each of the various organs and the diseases that we might choose to treat with this kind of regenerative medicine technology will vary. So I think the barriers are going to be different. Just as an example of the kinds of protocols that we might be able to put patients on in the, in the not too distant future, one is to take a liver from a donor, perhaps a deceased donor, wash away their liver cells, be left with the scaffolding of the liver, and then give someone stem cell, their own stem cells back and let that liver regenerate on that old scaffold, that scaffolding from another patient. My goodness. So, I mean, those are the kinds of things that we're hoping, th th those trials are already existing. All so right. That's, you know, that's a little bit out there, perhaps, but I mean, those are the, those are the exciting things we're hoping to be able to move towards. Exciting and encouraging, and uh, this lab opens next spring? We're hoping in the spring or, or summer. All right, very good. Gentlemen, good luck, and thank you both for joining us. Thank you very Great, much. Thank you. Tonight's edition of Arizona Giving and Leading focuses on Fresh Start, a local foundation that works to empower women to transform their lives through engagement and education. Joining us now is Fresh Start President and CEO Susan Berman, and also with us is Colleen Rossi, a former client at Fresh Start. Good to have you both here. Thank you for having us. Oh, Thank you, you betcha. Let's talk more about Fresh Start Women's Foundation. What right. are we talking about? Well, we're talking about an organization that has been around now for 21 years in the Phoenix community. It is a powerful organization that focuses on women and women's issues. Uh, we work with women every year to help empower her and bring her to a level of self-sufficiency. That might be, mean something very different for each woman that we work with. Last year, we saw over 5,000 women in our center, and and we've made huge impact in our community by addressing her issues. What kind of programs are available? Well, you know, a lot of organizations start and, and end with job placement, and we certainly do job readiness and job placement. But what sets us apart is we pay attention to the entire woman. What will help her identify what her goals are, help, help her overcome her barriers and her self-limitations, help her really get excited about what's in front of her, no matter what her transition is in life. And let's talk about your experiences there at Fresh Start. Uh, how did you get started? How did you know about Fresh Start? I was part of the community. I've been a community volunteer for a long, long time. And when my transition began and, and my, my world of my stability had, had fallen apart, it was when um, I realized I kind of looked at the truth that I was living in a one-bedroom home and um, I was, didn't have access to my funds anymore and life had changed. And someone said, you know, you need to be at Fresh Start. And it was just one word, one person who said, go. And I finally gave up that woulda, coulda, shoulda, and, and I went. I want to get back to your story in a second there, but I, I'm hearing something that I was going to ask you about. How important is it for folks? I mean, you can only do so much until they decide there's something to do. Mm. 
Well, actually, Fresh Start is there for the woman who has decided that she needs something different. Something's got to change for whatever reason in her world. And we are there to help her learn how to fish. We don't give to her. She does all the work herself. But we can help motivate her and illuminate her path uh, to move her forward to meet her goals. Sometimes she walks in the door and thinks, well, I just need a resume or something. She doesn't even know that she could set goals and she could attain those goals moving forward. Uh, so we're really there to help bolster her, move her along, give her some ideas, and mentor her on her process. Were you confident that this would work, or did you go in saying, uh, let's see what they got? No, I, I was really humbled and ashamed that I was there. I was signing under a different name entirely. I didn't want to know who I, what, that I was actually there. But what was happening was, I was they were building my team. I didn't even know I needed to have a team. And I started thinking about, I was talking to them about financials and first personal and emotional and, and, and all areas, they became my team to rebuild me. Did they become your team quickly? Could you see immediately that this was going to happen or was it something that the trust and the relationship had to build over time? I could tell it from the leaders. I could tell it from the, the moment that I would walk into a classroom and the person that was giving up of her time as a volunteer to help me and I realized that these leaders were generous. They were incredibly generous with their time and their talent and um, I realized that these were women that were extremely well connected to the valley and that they were doing it out of their own compassion to help someone else. And how long did it tra your transformation, how long did it take? I was there for at least 18 months on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, three nights a week, um, going in, as, taking every class I possibly could. Could you feel the transformation happening over time? Could you feel yourself growing? I could, I could feel that I was becoming stronger. I became confident again. I became no longer the victim and was willing to take the next step. And, and, and that word empower, we've mentioned it a couple of times here and I'm hearing it uh, from Colleen's story. It, it, it sounds as though you have, you have all this going for you let's show you how you have it going for you. Exactly, exactly. And for a woman to understand that she can do it, that she can make a difference in her own life and therefore in everybody's lives around her. But not only that she can, but she has an obligation to and there is a way to do it. None of us get anywhere in life without assistance and information and support from others. And our clients are no different. They simply need that guidance and that support and they are off and running and making big differences. It is such a privilege to work for an organization that makes this kind of impact uh, because I know that when we impact her, we impact her community, we impact her families, we impact uh, the very fabric in which we live, and it's really exciting. The programs, I, I see this career services programs, self-esteem programs, mentoring programs, education programs. Who is responsible for instructing or leading or guiding those programs? Well, we have first a staff of phenomenal women, 27 full-time staff who uh, work in this arena constantly. We have social workers on board. We have a number of staff that do different things within this. Um, as Colleen mentioned also, a huge plethora of volunteers who come in who have expertise in different fields and they give of their time to come in and teach and, and instruct and coach our clients one-on-one -on -one or in a classroom setting. And so they get the best of all worlds. Was there a single program that influenced you the most do you think absolutely the finance that, that's the one mm -hmm. absolutely it was it was the area where I could finally look at a budget understand a budget and and um, and begin to not focus on also I had to focus on my own but it was the first time that I really decided to grow up I was gonna say was it the fact that you could now figure out you know debits and credits and, and, and columns or was it the fact that once you figured it out you figured it out I figured it out. Once I could speak the language, then, yes. I, then I understood what was going on. And the confidence therein had to be helpful. Incredibly helpful. Is that, is that a factor as well? I mean, it's one thing to say you can balance a checkbook, you can do the mortgage, you know, all that kind of business. But It's more than that. It, yeah, I'm sure it is. Mm -hmm. But it's another thing to say you can yeah. do it, you did it. And that's the crux of it, I think, is the confidence piece. Mm -hmm. It's the confidence to know that there are things to do and I can do them and I can learn them. And there are people that are going to teach me and help me along the way. Um, I think that is really the crux of what Fresh Start offers. So what do you tell people now about your life? Well, I mean, I love to tell the fact that a single mom and a special needs child in the middle of a recession. Uh, without any experience in wholesale or retail, I walk into a bank and I ask for a loan and they said yes. That only happened because I had the confidence that, that Fresh Start had given me. I understood now what it was that I needed. And so it's completely 
changed who I am and how I could help support my family and change them as well, their lives as well. I'm sure you've had a number of those kinds of success stories. Every day, every day, and it really, like I said, it's a privilege to be able to be part of that. Well, it's great to have you both on the program. Good luck, continued success. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, we take another look at the issue of medical marijuana for children, this time from the viewpoint of the medical community. And we'll hear about water management challenges facing the cotton industry. That's Tuesday evening, 5.30 and 10 on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.